Inside, it's comfortable. Inside a house, inside a family, inside a routine. But what if we widen our view beyond the fence across the street? Outside, we find people struggling with loneliness, poverty, families that don't look like ours, or without a safe family at all. Jesus didn't call us to live by our neighbors. He called us to love our neighbors. Uh, many of you guys know that my family and I, uh, Sarah and Andy and Bethy, our, our kids, uh, had the opportunity to live in Uganda, which is a country in East Africa, for uh, just about a year. Um, and th we've been back three or four years now. Uh, we were living there as missionaries. And so we were connected with lots of different communities and pastors and churches and stuff. And one day, um, one of my pastor friends there, uh, his name is Peter, he had called me and said, hey, I need you to take a ride with me. Okay. So we get in the truck and we drive out to this village and we pull up to this uh, house and there's just people everywhere. Uh, there's motorbikes, you know, little motorcycles parked and cars are just all over the yard and in front of the neighbor's yard and um, there's just people sitting outside. So we park and we get out and he says, hey, why don't you, and we found another friend that we knew. He says, hey, why don't you hang out here? That guy's name was Cockroach, by the way, which is a story unto itself, right? So you hang out here with Cockroach. Pastor Peter's got to go in the house. And so I'm hanging out with Cockroach and it's about as weird as you think it is. And uh, there's just all these people and they're not really doing anything. And I'm looking around and some of them have chairs and some of them are just on the ground. Some of them are leaning on, you know, uh, the car's or sitting on a pickup bed or whatever. They're just, they're just there. They're not doing anything. They're just kind of talking. And there's just this one woman screaming, just yelling. Hey, cockroach, what is happening? What is going on? I said, well, the person yelling is the mom and uh, her son, who is you know, like 20 or so, you know, maybe late teens, but young adult, uh, was killed in a motorcycle accident. And so they're getting ready to bring him home from the hospital to the house because we don't, there's not the mortuary step, right? There's no, like, just place that this just happens. It's the duty of the family to take care of this body. And just this wailing, this moaning, it's just nonstop. And sometimes there'll be another voice that joins in another person yelling or screaming or crying out just loudly. And meanwhile, there's just there's literally a hundred people just hanging out in front of this house. Cockroach, why are all these people here? What are we what is going on? I said, well this is what we do. You don't do this? No, we don't do this. What what do you mean this is what 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 is happening? All of the friends, all of the neighbors, all of the family has come to be with this mother and father and brother and sister and all that in support of their loss. Well, what are they going to do? They're already doing it. They're doing everything they do. Is they just come. They just sit. Well, what are all these people going to eat? We'll figure it out. Well, what are they going to do? They're going to stay here. How long are they going to stay? Well, the funeral will be tomorrow. So they're going to stay here all night? Yeah, most of them. And then there'll be more people here tomorrow. It's strange. It's weird. I didn't grasp it. We didn't stay all night, which was I was okay with that. But we did go back the next day for the funeral, and sure enough, there was about three times as many people just out in the front yard and in the neighbor's yard and on the cars and just there. It's foreign. I mean, literally, this was another country, right? This is a foreign concept to us. Nobody brought a chicken casserole. Nobody came and made sure people were dressed the right way. Nobody said, oh, well, we got to schedule the funeral for Saturday because that matches up well. The school will be out and this, you know, I'll be off of work and this person can get here. They just said, come here and be here. And that's all we need. Jesus talks a lot in the Bible and in the account of his life about being a good neighbor. Love your neighbors. 
and it's written down in many different places. All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the guys who actually wrote down about the life of Jesus, all four of them quoted him saying that. Now, sometimes they would include different stuff, or they'd write about this story, and somebody else would exclude it or whatever, but all four of them put that in. That gives me a clue, hey, this is going to be important. Not only that, but it's quoted back a bunch of times on how to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. In Galatians, Paul writes a letter to the church at Galatia, and he says, hey, guess what? You have to love your neighbor. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that is more than one word. He's talking about love. Love fulfills the law. What law is he talking about? Well, in the Old Testament, right, before Jesus came, the law was very long. There's the Ten Commandments, and there's hundreds of smaller laws that are listed in Deuteronomy and all that, right? If you want to go ahead, I mean, it would say how, how to interact and what situation and what are you supposed to wear and when are you supposed to wear it. All of these uh, laws, right, that the Jewish people lived under, but he, all of that was fulfilled with one word, love, and specifically, love your neighbor. There's... Is, this is, this is the concept we're working with, right? This is why we have a series called How to Neighbor. Because there's people around us all the time. And we have interactions and relationships and people that we know. And they're in our lives. But when was the last time that we just went to their house and just sat? Because that's what they needed most. How to Neighbor. And so each week we have an I will statement. This week's I will statement is I will rejoice and mourn with my neighbor. So important. Welcome to Olive Branch Chapel. My name is Nick. I am the pastor here. Uh, and as you're joining us in person, we're so glad that you're here. If you're joining us through digital on Facebook Live or watching this later on the Internet, hello, welcome to you as well. How to neighbor. I will rejoice. I will mourn with my neighbors. And always hinges on love. Life is a series of ups and downs, right? It's just like when you get on the, the stationary bike at the gym, right? And you can pick the hilly one. It goes up and down and up and down. And it gets harder and easier and harder and easier, right? Okay, it's just hard, right? But that's what life is like. It's constant up and downs. We all have victories, we all have losses. And all of these different things bring about an emotional response. There is emotion tied to all of those things that makes connections in our brains. So think about one of your most exciting times that you can remember. Maybe it was when you got married, the birth of your children, you got a raise, you won the big game, or somebody just said, hey, good job today. Whatever it is, something that was an exciting moment for you. That event is usually paired with the memory of the people who were involved in that. Did that happen for you when you thought of it? Did you think of the people who were with you? What about a less happy memory, grieving a loss, a major sickness, some painful event in your life? You have a very deep bond with the people that you walked through that with, right? Why do people like scary movies? No, it's a legit question. Why? I don't get it. Like, it's not my thing, right? But why do people like watching scary movies with their friends? Why do people like watching things that keep them on the edge of their seat? It release being scared, whether it's from a movie or real life, releases a chemical in your brain, right? Well, if you're scared in real life, that chemical is supposed to get you to safety, right? It's giving you some action, fight or flight or whatever it is, right? That dopamine is released. Well, if you're just watching a movie and you don't actually have to take some action, that chemical is also released. But what it does is it creates a bond with the memory of what's happening. Now, the other people that you're with, that's also happening. This is a very similar thing to when you have a relational connection with someone. 
So if you're really trying to bond with this person, take your first date to a scary movie because you're both going to have this chemical release and it's going to bond you to closer together and you're going to have this thing, right? It, it literally changes the chemistry in your brain. Now, this is not a trick, right? But this, this happens, right? Think about it uh, in other terms. What are careers that we think of traditionally of the tightest bond among colleagues? Soldiers. Okay, well, that's scary. If you're fighting war together, you know, the, the whole idea of it, once you've been in the trenches with someone, that bond is for life, right? You haven't seen that person for 50 years, but if they show up or they need something, we are there, right? Same with, like, cops and firefighters. Like, these scary, stressful, difficult things bond you together because of these chemical releases in your brain and these shared situations, these commonalities bring you closer and closer together. So when we talk about our exciting life events, whether they're exciting high or exciting low, right, good things, bad things, or, or just major moments in our life, we are very bonded with the people that we are around as we go through that. When we're excited, we want to share that with other people. When we're sad or scared, we tend to lean on others and get support from each other. And as believers, we want to help people. And when do they need help? In the low moments of life. And that tends to bond us to one another. You know what this is called? Sympathy. Compassion for others. These are good traits to have. Some of us, it comes more natural than others. For example, my wife and I. Some of us, it comes natural. Some of us have to be told by our wife, hey, you should be more nicer. You need to have sympathy for people. Hypothetically, of course. Most of us would just consider this being a good person. Oh, I'm a good person. I care about others. Oh, man, that's a really hard situation that that person's going through. I hurt for them or I hurt with them. Oh, man, that's great news. I'm so excited for you. That genuine response, it doesn't do anything for me, right? Like, this is not about me, your kid getting into the college they wanted, or uh, they took their first steps, or they said their first word, or whatever this thing is. Oh, they're, they're healed from their condition, or they're not sick anymore. That We get excited about these things for the other people because it's called being nice. It's a reaction that's embedded in our hearts and in our souls and in our brains to care for other people. And that's great. But it's more than just being nice. It's more than just being a good person. I believe that this is the very work of God in our lives. The mark of a true Christian, according to Paul, this is in Romans, the mark of a true Christian includes rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is in the chapter that Paul wrote called Mark's of a true Christian. We don't do a lot of checklists here at Olive Branch, right? We talk about it's a relationship with God, not you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. But if we were going to make a list, this would go on it, right? A genuine care for other people. God has put that within us to be excited with exciting moments, even if it doesn't affect us directly, but also to mourn, to be sad, to feel that empathy, that sympathetic reaction to when someone else is struggling with something. Paul put it another way uh, to a, a different church. He wrote in Galatians 6 to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Again, it comes back to Jesus taught us, Jesus called us to love others, to love our neighbors. This is all the same thing. It's taking care of other people. It's taking the love that we experience from God and not just bottling it up and keeping it for ourselves, but sharing it with the other people in our lives as well. Bear one another burdens to fulfill the law of Christ. There's a story in the Bible that many of us have heard of. It's called the prodigal son, and I'm just going to paraphrase it for us. There was a son and a father, and the son was sick of it. He must have turned 17 or maybe 19 or whatever the age of that, you know, because we all go through that, right, of oh, I don't want to be under your thumb anymore, Dad, right? Okay. 
You don't have to show your hand. That's fine. But we've all had that moment, right? So this happens in that household. And he says, hey, Dad, I'm out of here. Why don't you just give me my inheritance now? I'm done with you. Dad says, well, I don't feel great about this, but sure, here you go. Here's your inheritance. I guess I'm dead to you now. So the son leaves. He ends up blowing it, right, and just... You can imagine a teenager with all this money, same thing as what happened today, right? And eventually, he has this realization of, I got to go home. He walks up. His dad sees him coming from a distance. He runs to him, wraps him up in a big hug. The son starts to apologize, starts to, you know, say, oh, I'm so sorry. He goes, hold on. You are my son, and you are home, and I am excited about it. We probably have some things to talk about, but for now, let's just be excited that you came home. So he calls the servants over, right, the people who worked for him. He said, bring my son some fresh clothes. Bring him a ring, a ring, not just so he could look fancy, right, but the symbol of being included in family, right? When you're starting a family, you exchange rings, right? Bring my boy some clothes, and a ring. He is back, and guess what? We're going to throw a big old party. And it wasn't that the dad and the son went out and just did something, went fishing together and said, wow, I'm sure glad you're home. But they invited everybody in. They killed the fattened calf because, hey, if we're going to have a party, we got to have some meat, and we got to have something to drink. And Right? He's rejoicing, and he's thrilled, and he's excited, and he's including everybody around him because this isn't a moment just for him. This is something to be shared. We're excited about this, right? It's awesome. So just like when you have something great, you call all the neighbors and you throw a big party and uh, all of that stuff, right? Every time you have good news, you throw a big party. No, what do we do? We put it on Facebook. and, and Oh, yeah, like, 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 like. Oh, look, we're having a big party. Everybody's rejoicing with me. We're so excited, right? Even in this separation of our digital lives and we don't even look at each other anymore, we just look at our phones, all that stuff, we still have this strong desire to connect with other people and celebrate with other people when something goes well, right? We do it a little differently now. It might not be as extravagant as killing the fattened calf and having a big old party, right? But we still want that connection with others, not only of, hey, look, my son came home. I'm so excited. But also, hey, look, your son came home. I'm so happy for you, right? Hey, look, you did get into college. Or, hey, look, you're not sick anymore. Or, hey, you did get that promotion at work. Or, hey, you, you got out of debt. Or, hey, you woke up another day and we're happy for you. Whatever that is, right? If you're celebrating, we want to celebrate that with you. That's our draw. That's our thing. Because God has put that in our hearts to have this connection with other people, to rejoice with our neighbors, but also to mourn. And perhaps even more importantly, as we're mourning, it's a lot easier to come up with examples of that. Am I right? Times that you were struggling and you were looking for help. Times when you saw somebody else who was in need and you just had this heart burden to step into that somehow. Even if you didn't know what you were doing, you didn't know how to do it or whatever that looked like, right? But something other than that stinks moving on, right? Something we want to know what we can do. What can I do? What can I do? How we process the events of life will be a testimony to who our God is. We can talk about God a lot, am I right? We can post on Facebook and tweet about it and Instagram and all these things. We can say who our God is all the time, but how we actually live demonstrates it and says a whole lot more than our words ever will. We, we hit this a little bit last week talking about, like, don't be a hypocrite and you know, all that type of stuff, right? This flows into that. What we say is one thing. What we do is another. The way that we live, the way that we process the events in our life, whether they're highs or lows, exciting things or challenging things, or sometimes it's both, right? How we go through those will show who we really believe our God is. If we worship the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipotent God of heaven and earth, then the issues that arise in my life will never knock him off his throne.
But when I'm fickle, when I worship at the altar of feeling good and having enough and life going well for me, then in short order, our hopes will be dashed. We all got struggles. We all got problems. This life that we're living, it's not perfect. We, this world, it's challenging. It's fallen. It's sinful. Like w- There are struggles, right? This is not the type of church that you can come in and say, hey, I'm going to be a Christian, so that means I'm always going to have enough, right? I'm just going to I'm going to get more money and nobody's ever going to get sick and nobody's even ever going to be mad at me again. It's all smiles from here on out. Thank you Jesus. I'm sorry. We missed the memo on that. We're dealing with reality. Of following Jesus actually makes life harder in a lot of situations. Example number 1, Jesus uh, got killed, right? So if being Jesus is not enough to have health and wealth and prosperity, then I'm sure following him might not cut the standard either. Instead, God actually promises that this life is going to have challenges. There are going to be issues. There are going to be problems. So guess what? How we deal with those things in our life, how we help other people deal with those things is a testimony to who our God really is. Jesus was told that a friend of his was sick. Hey, Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Okay. How sick is he? Again, we're paraphrasing, right? Oh, he's pretty sick. You probably ought to go visit him. We're, we're actually not sure he's going to make it. Okay. Hey, guys, let's go visit Lazarus. Oh, we just got to make this stop over here real quick. Okay, so we, we're, we're working our way uh, from where they were over to Bethany, right? What a cool place that must have been, right? Named for Bethany. All right. Uh, so they, they meander there. It takes them a couple days. It takes them a couple days to get there. You can read this whole story, by the way, uh, in John chapter 11. We're going to do bits and part of it today. So he did decide to go not only because he cared for his friend, but he cared for that friend's family. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? And they kind of got into it a little. Jesus shows up at their house, and one of them's like, oh, Jesus, let me just listen to you and talk to you and, like, sit at your feet and learn from you and experience your presence, right? And then the other one's like, whoa, Jesus is my house. I better start cleaning and cooking. And, you know, like if Jesus showed up at your house this morning, you'd be like, hold on, let me put the laundry away real quick, right? Oh, I better serve you some food, right? So there's that, that's those people, Mary and Martha, had a brother named Lazarus. He gets sick. So not only does Jesus want to go be with Lazarus because he's sick, but he also has compassion for his sisters who are obviously quite concerned about him. Before Jesus arrived, Lazarus dies. Whoops, that's not good. Many people came with them to grieve and offer support. John eleven nineteen. Many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Jesus walks to Bethany because they had not invented the 15-passenger van yet. So he walks himself over to Bethany, and all of his disciples, they all get there, and they're like, oh, Jesus, you're here. Oh, too late. He already died. And all these other people showed up. They must have heard my story about Uganda because they all showed up. They're all hanging out in the front yard, right? And they're there mourning the loss of their brother. Martha rushes out to Jesus, tells him what happened, and Jesus consoles her. He tells her that it's going to be okay. Let's pick it up with verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Okay, pause there. Okay. Martha rushes out and says, hey, Jesus, I wish you had been here, but it's okay. I still have faith. It's 
Very important example. We're going to pick that up in a minute. But remember, Martha still has faith. Jesus says, hey, don't worry. It's going to be okay. She says, yes, I have faith it's going to be okay because I know it's going to be okay for all of us. She doesn't know what comes next. She just knows that God is good, and eventually those who know God will get to be with God again. She's referring to when everybody is swept up and gets to go to heaven. Jesus says, but wait, there's more. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall yet live. And someone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She's probably like, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of confusing, Jesus. But she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Her faith is our example. Faith is the most important factor that we have to bring to these situations. It is more important than our salad or our casserole. It is more important than the card that we painstakingly pick off the rack and try to write something helpful in to give to this person who we just don't know what to say. It's more important than the action. It's more important than any of the platitudes that we try so hard to say. What is important in this story? It's her faith. God is still in control. God, I trust you. I don't know what's happening. What are you talking about that we will die but we'll never die? What What are you? God, I don't get it, but I get you and I trust you. That's what we can get from Martha here, right? Typical Jesus. He can't say it just straight. He's got to say, well, you're going to die, but then you're never going to die, and you're going to be raised to life, but I'm all right. I am the life. And What are you talking about, Jesus? I trust you, though. It's okay. Who's been there? Who's there right now? What are you talking about, Jesus? I'm, just, I'm trying to trust you, man. What is happening? That's my life. That's all of our lives at times, right? And that's what we're talking about. It's about faith. It's not about always understanding it. It's not about having the answers. It's not about knowing what to say or what to think or what to believe other than God is good. God loves us. God loves you. And eventually, somehow, we have to trust that it's going to be okay. It might not be okay today. Guess what? It's okay. If you're not okay today or tomorrow or whatever day that is, it's okay. You don't always have to have it all figured out. Just focus on faith. The healing power of the Holy Spirit is alive in all believers. We carry that with us to our neighbors. Now, wouldn't it be nice if every time somebody died, we walked over to him and said, hey, he's not dead, he's just asleep. Has that happened to anybody here? Hasn't happened to me yet. But you know what does happen? My faith in God helps people focus on what is real and what will not change. Your faith in God, the Holy Spirit living within us. If you believe in Jesus, then he has given you the Holy Spirit. And yes, it sounds a little bit weird, but it's okay. We'll get there. But when you carry the Holy Spirit into these situations, when you say, but God is still good, that is miraculous healing power. They don't have to get up out of their grave for somebody to be healed. The healing might not be that person. It might be the person that you're talking to. You might be bringing some faith into their life that they haven't experienced in a very long time. Or maybe until this moment they had faith and we just don't know if we can get through this anymore. But we're bringing power into that. Let's go to verse 28. When she said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and calling for you. When she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. Okay, so they're kind of at the outskirts of town. Jesus hasn't gone in yet. Martha goes to get Mary. Mary goes out to them. When Jesus, no, when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her, remember all these people showed up. All these people have come around. They're consoling. They're just being with, right? So all these people saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her. Supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Does that make sense? Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
Now, I hate to do this to Mary and Martha, but once again, we have one sister who gets it and one sister who doesn't quite get it. Almost, but not quite. She's got the reverence down, right? She's got the, oh, God, you're so powerful. Oh, God, you're so great, right? But she doesn't get the faith part. She doesn't get the relationship part. Because we've, got, we've got Mary who wants to do the cooking and the cleaning and get all that stuff done, right? And then we've got Mary in this story who rushes out, well, if you had been here, it would have been okay. Martha is saying, hey, it's okay, you're here. You're here now. This is your plan, God. This is your story, God. This is whatever you think is best, God. Not, oh, if you had done, or if you had done it in the way that I understood, or God, I had this really well planned out. I don't know why you didn't get on board with this. Come on, I told you what I wanted. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Verse 35, Jesus wept. That's the end of the verse, by the way. That's the total verse. Jesus wept. Verse 36, so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So we've got, again, these two ideas. One saying, oh, look, God cares so much. God loves you so much. And look, he is moved by your movement. He is crying because you're crying. He is weeping with you. He is mourning with you. And then you've got these other people come over here. Well, yeah, but if God's so good, why do all these bad things happen to begin with? Believe it or not, this is not a new idea of people doubting God or doubting God's goodness because bad things happen. It's not an original thought. We could spend weeks on why didn't God? fill in the blank. Why didn't God heal my son? Why didn't God save my wife? Why did this happen? Even to the good people, right? Air quotes, good people, the faithful people, the people who've done everything. They gave all this money to the church and they still got sick. That's not fair, God. What is going on? Why do bad things happen? What did Jesus do? Jesus said, man, that stinks. I feel bad for you, and I feel bad for me. Like, this is a bad thing that we're walking through together. But then you got these other people nitpicking over here. Jesus feels compassion for his friends. He is moved in his spirit, that same spirit that we carry with us, right? It said Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit. Well, guess what? The spirit of God lives within us. So when you are deeply moved by a situation, it is a good, godly thing. That compassion is a gift from God. Use it. Carry it forward. The Holy Spirit is moved with compassion and sympathy. We feel that same tug on our hearts, that desire to love, to help, to care for, to invest in other people. These are God-given feelings, this calling to serve. I wish I could do something. I don't know what to do, but there's got to be something I can do. That is God telling you that you have a role to play in this. But at the same time, there's that other voice, that voice of doubt, that voice of fear, that misguided anger. People use negative experiences to doubt God's goodness or his existence all the time. How could a loving God let this happen? People use problems to accuse others of a lack of faith. Have you ever heard these horrible things? I know it comes from what people think is a good place, but you just have to pray correctly and this will stop. I'll punch you in the face. This must be a punishment for somebody's sin. What? Have you read the Bible? The, Jesus directly addressed this exact situation, not only the one that we're reading, but in Jesus' life, he, they go to a blind guy and these religious teachers, right, the Jews, the, one, the Pharisees and all that, they come together and say, hey, Jesus, look, we found this blind guy. Surely that's a result of sin, right? Was it his sin or was it his parents' sin who made him blind? What does Jesus do? He goes, what are you all talking about? And he heals him 
and he restores this sight to this blind man who was born blind. Born blind, and yet they're thinking, well, maybe he did something wrong. Oh, when? Before he was born? That doesn't matter. Well, it must have been his parents' generational sin inherited into the womb. God says, it's about the goodness of of God being displayed in his life, him having faith regardless of being born blind, me having the opportunity, me being Jesus, having the opportunity to heal him, to step into this life and use this for the greater good, the kingdom of God, not just for your little bit of understanding, but for generations now, thousands of years later, still trying to wrap our feeble little minds around this idea of, wait, but bad things happen to good people. I don't understand. And God says, your faith is what matters. It's about the goodness of God and your trust in that, your belief in that, not your idea of what that should look like. The story of Job, similar example, and we're going to do a lot of paraphrasing here and just pull out a couple key verses for us to read story of Job, right? You, you probably have heard this if you've, you know, been to nursery stories or whatever, right? Job was a guy, he lived righteously for God, and the devil went to God and was like, hey, I bet you I can get Job to sin, and God was like, no, I bet you can't. We're paraphrasing. Uh, and the devil says, well, let me try, and God says, okay. Hope that I'm not caught up in that ever, right? But for the goodness of God to be displayed, sometimes bad things happen in our life. So Job's family is attacked. His farm animals are killed. His land is poisoned. His kids are killed. His wife is killed. And he just ends up there all by himself. Everybody dead, broke, sad, horrible. So he's got these three friends that show up. Do we have this verse? When Job's three friends heard of all the evil that had come upon him, they came from each from his own place. And then these people did some stuff. And they made an appointment together to come and show him sympathy and comfort him. Now, you should not skip over parts of the Bible because you don't like them. Just because you're worried you can't pronounce them, it's okay. They came to show him sympathy and comfort him. Oh, that's nice. That's nice. What did they do? They showed up. They came to him. Number two, they sympathized with Job. 2.12 says, they raised their voices and wept. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads towards heaven. In other words, they were really upset, <laughs> and they were upset with Job. Not at Job, not for Job, but being there with him and being sympathetic, going, man, this is really, really hard. Oh, I'm so upset. And then number three, they spent time with Job. Verse 2.13 says, they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was great. True to form to the example of my life and maybe yours. Everything was great until they opened their mouths. The problem started when they decided they needed to speak. All three of them are given a whole chapter in this story about their speech to Job about how there must have been something he could have done differently to keep this from happening. There must be something in your life that you're not telling us. Job, this just doesn't really make sense the way that you're telling us. Are you sure you didn't sin? Are you sure you didn't do something to deserve this or to cause this or to bring this on yourself? All three of them separately come at Job saying, bro, we just don't get it. Surely there's something going on here. They repeatedly tell Job to repent, that his suffering can stop because, you know, once you deal with this issue, then God can bless you again. I think I've heard that somewhere a little more modern. Job 16, 12. 
I've heard many such things. Miserable comforters are you all. Y'all stink as friends, is what Job says. Like, hey, we were good until you started talking. I did not ask you for an explanation. I did not need you to come here and tell me all the horrible things I did to make all these things happen. Because what's the reality? Sometimes that's true. Sometimes we do mess up and then bad things happen, right? Sometimes I spend too much money and then I don't have any more money. Do I need somebody to come to me and say, well, hey, dummy, if you hadn't spent all your money, today would be a better day. Does that help me at all? And sometimes it has nothing to do with me at all. Sometimes people get sick. Sometimes people die. Sometimes bad things happen. Well, guess what? I don't need people to come to me and say, well, maybe if you pray this way, you know, things would be different. Y'all, everything was good until they opened their mouths. Why did they open their mouths? Because silence is uncomfortable. Because in our minds and in our hearts and in our souls, we're asking the same questions as they're asking. And we are uncomfortable with those questions. And so we try to formulate answers just to make ourselves feel a little bit better because that might cut some of the tension in the room because we know that they're suffering. And maybe if I could just understand this a little bit better, I could share that with them and this would just be 1% better if we just had a little bit of understanding. Does that sound like faith? Or does that sound like relying on my abilities, my human understanding, my human understanding and strength and abilities? Or am I going to have faith in God? The reality is we do not know why people are suffering. It is possible a result of sin or bad behavior or poor choices. That is possible. It is possible that it has nothing to do with that and something bad happened. Was it because of his sin or his parents' sin that he's blind? It doesn't matter, but I'm going to heal him. Guess what? Now the focus is back on God. The focus is back on faith. The focus is back on anything except my understanding or my limited abilities. We don't know why a person is suffering. Our focus is on faith. Our role is not to identify the cause. Our role is to offer love, sympathy, support. This world is cold and difficult and troublesome. We can show God's love. We can celebrate with our neighbors' victories, rejoicing with them. We are called to mourn and comfort those who are suffering, mourning with them, encouraging them with the presence of the Holy Spirit of God and our faith in Jesus focuses on faith. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for loving us enough to redeem us, to allow us to have relationship with you. Lord, we know that we are not perfect, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we can come to you anyway. We thank you, Jesus, for going before us and interceding on our behalf. And we thank you, Lord, for sending us the Holy Spirit so that we can take your presence to other people. We pray for opportunities to rejoice with our neighbors. And we pray that we see the need for demonstrating faith and sympathy and compassion for our neighbors, for our friends, for our families. And, Lord, when we are walking through those, I pray that others would spend the time to invest in us as well. In Jesus' name I pray.